When you study electromagnetism, one of the most important principles relating electric fields and electric charges is Gauss's law. Gauss's law is a relationship, as we'll see, between the behavior of fields at a given point and the electric charge's density at that point. And it's powerful, it's always true, and in most cases it's really hard to use it effectively to study, to figure out what the electric field is due to a charge distribution. But there are three special field configurations that arise in situations with just the right kinds of symmetry of your charge distribution uh, that can give you simple enough field configurations that Gauss's law becomes simple, becomes easy to use, and when those apply, it is by far the easiest way to find the electric field due to that charge distribution. So uh, I've talked elsewhere about what those distributions are and how they limit the field, but uh, let's look at a specific case here. I'm going to consider an infinite cylinder that has a non-uniform charge density through it, but a charge density with a nice symmetric pattern to it. So let's, let me set up my case. I have this infinite cylinder of radius r stretched along out in space, and the, I've chosen coordinates so the z-axis runs along the center of the cylinder. Uh, in my form of, of cylindrical coordinates, I'm using little s to be the distance from the axis at any given point. So this point is the distance s from the closest point along the axis. Phi would be the coordinate around the cylinder. But, as we'll see, phi won't be important here because I've stated for this particular case that the charge density, that is, how much charge there is at any given point inside the cylinder, is given by this formula. It's rho naught, some constant. Rho, the Greek letter rho, is traditionally used for charge density, or for any sort of density, really. Uh, rho naught is some reference density, a constant, times 1 minus s over r. What's that mean? That means that when s equals zero, the charge density is rho naught. Rho naught is the charge density along the axis of the cylinder. And as s gets bigger and bigger, one minus s over r gets smaller until I get s equals r, where this is one minus r over r, that's zero. And so there's zero charge density at the surface of the cylinder. And I said that outside of the cylinder, rho equals zero. There's no charge anywhere else in the universe. So I want to know what is the electric field in this situation. That's my question. What's my electric field? And there's a five-step process that we use to do this. Uh, the first step in trying to use Gauss's law the first step we always do is we ask is my field conf configuration, is the electric field um, one of my special fields? Is it unidirectional Is it unidirectional, or is it axial, or is it radial, or is it something else? That's my first question. And in this case, I can look at this, that the, as we've talked about symmetry principles, we look at this and we say, well, because this is an infinite cylinder, that means that it has infinite cylindrical symmetry. It has that it has that symmetry, and as we've argued before, uh, notice that the charge distribution only depends on the distance from the axis, so it doesn't matter if we rotate it, the charge distribution doesn't change if we rotate around the axis. If we reverse it, the charge distribution doesn't change if we do a complete reversal, 180 degree reversal, and those constraints tell me that my electric field is going to be, uh, not this one, my electric field is going to be in the s direction and only a function of s. So s hat means straight away from the axis. It's some function straight away from the axis. And the function has got to be a function only of the distance from the axis s. Can't be a function of z because we could slide it back and forth and it would change, it won't change. So I've got this special case. I'm in the axial case. If it were other, we'd have to stop and use some other method for finding the electric field. But if it's unidirectional axial radial, we get to use Gauss's law. So in this case, we're in good shape. First step, taken care of. The second step is, once we've chosen this, we're, the second step is to write Gauss's law for this case. And this is one where I'm not going to derive it for you. We just look it up in our book, what the special case, what we do in this special case. And when we're in axial fields, Gauss's law in general is that the gradient 
del dot E, the gradient of the electric field, is equal to charge density divided by epsilon naught. That's Gauss's law. And in the special case of an axial field, that divergence, the divergence of the electric field, has a special form. We can write that 1 over s times the derivative with respect to s of s times that coefficient e sub s has to equal rho over epsilon naught. That's my story. This is, this is my equation for finding what this, uh, what this comes out to be. I've got this. Th this is the form of the divergence, del dot e, the divergence of the electric field. This is what it is for the special case of an axial field. We're just going to look that up because there are only three cases where we, where we do this anyway. We can look up those three cases. Any textbook will derive what those are for you if you've, if you've done Gauss's law in that way. So, okay, we've got that. Next step then, we've written that down. The next step is we need to divide, we're a function of just one variable now, a function of just s. So we're going to divide the range of our variable into regions, in, into chunks of known charge density, of known rho. So for us, that means we're going to look at the ranges of s where rho is different. So in particular, for us, we're going to say there is um, the range where s is between 0 and r, and in that range, as we've said, the charge density is rho naught times 1 minus s over r. And then there's the range s greater than or equal r, and there the charge density equals 0. So we've got two chunks, two regions, two, two ranges of s to consider. Next, the next step is where we actually do some calculus. The next step is that we integrate separately in each region. Integrate separately in each region. So when I say integrate, I've got this equation down here I'm going to use. And I've got a derivative in it. I need to do an integral to get rid of a derivative. So what I'm going to do is I'll start in our first region. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start in our first region. I will say in this region, 0 less than or equal to s less than or equal to r. I've got this equation. I'm going to multiply both sides by s. So I'll get that d by ds of s times e sub s <laughs> equals s times rho over epsilon naught. And so that equals s times this, that is rho naught s minus s squared over r is what I have. That when I multiply s times rho over epsilon naught, rho naught over epsilon naught, sorry. I forgot my epsilon naught. Rho naught over epsilon naught times this. That's just multiplying, doing this thing. And now I have a derivative equal to this. I can integrate both sides of that equation. So if I now integrate both sides, integral ds, integral ds, I guess I could have written integral ds here. I'm going to integrate both sides of that equation. And what does that give me? Well, the integral of a derivative is just the thing itself. So uh, I should change colors just to make this a little more readable. Um, uh, the integral of a derivative is just the thing itself. So I can write, that, write down then that s times e sub s, you remember e sub s is my coefficient of the s hat, s times e sub s equals this integral, the rho naught and epsilon naught are constants, they come out, rho naught over epsilon naught times what's inside? Integral of s is 1 half s squared minus 1 third s cubed over r that's my integral, plus, I'll call this a constant C1. Remember, it's an indefinite integral. I have to have a constant C1 out front. 
And so what's that tell me? I can finally solve and say that e sub s equals, divide both sides by s, I'll get that this is rho naught over epsilon naught times one half, at, no, no, not one over s, <laughs> times one half s minus one third s squared over r plus c1 over s. Remember, my constant of integration out there is still there, so I have to divide it by s as well. All right, that's my e sub s in region one. Next, I'll look at my second region um, for, uh, for s greater than or equal to r. I've got the same idea, except the right-hand side is much easier. This time, if I multiply both sides by s, rho is zero. So I get d by ds, that's a d, really a, a partial, d by ds of s times e sub s equals zero. Again, I integrate both sides with respect to s. I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. I do integral ds, integral ds. What's that give me? My right-hand side is going to be just a constant. Uh, that, that's gonna, I'll, I'll write it down in detail. I'll go ahead and say, when I do that integral, same thing here, that gives me that s times e sub s equals, I'll call it c2. It's a different constant because it's a different region. Or in other words, e sub s in this region equals c2 over s. And I'm done. That's my whole story right there. All right, so I've done step four. I've integrated separately in each region and gotten separate constants of integration in each region. And now it's time for step five. Step five, the way I would phrase it, is apply boundary conditions. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means. Apply boundary conditions. Uh, so where are the boundaries? The boundaries are places at the ends of my regions of s. So s equals zero is a boundary, because that's, as, that's the innermost rate point. s equals r is a boundary between these two regions. And then I guess we could say s equals infinity is a boundary. We'll, we'll see if we have to even worry about that one. So uh, let's look at it, applying boundary conditions. Well, at s equals zero, what do we know about the electric field at s equals zero? I can look at the, that, that, that would apply in this case. At s equals zero, my electric field, well, which way does it point? I said my electric field points in the s hat direction, but that doesn't really make sense when you're on the axis, right? Which direction is away when you're on the axis? Every direction, no direction. No direction is actually the key idea there. The only way to have a consistent electric field at the axis is if the electric field is zero at the axis. That's the only, if it's an axial field, it must be zero at the axis by symmetry. There's no other way for it to go. It couldn't be pointing that way because if you rotate, it would go that way. So, so at s equals zero, my electric field equals zero by symmetry, I guess. Or because you don't want it to be infinite. So at s equals zero, looking at this, that tells me that e sub s equals rho naught over epsilon naught times one half times zero minus one third times zero squared over r plus c1 over s, <laughs> c1 over zero, oh my goodness. The only way this doesn't make sense, the, the only way this can make sense is if c1 equals zero. I have to conclude that my c1 constant of integration is zero or else I wouldn't get electric field equals zero. I'd actually get electric field equals infinity there. So I have to have this. This is one of my results. Next, my next boundary is at s equals r. And there, the tool we use there is the requirement that electric fields have to be continuous across boundaries. You can actually prove that with Gauss's law if you really want to. But uh, we'll just call it the continuity constraint. says that the electric field on one side of the boundary has to equal the electric field on the other side of the boundary. So that tells me then that this one, uh, <clears throat> the continuity constraint tells me that 
rho naught over epsilon naught times one half r minus one third r squared over r plus zero, remember, c1 is zero, has to equal this, c2 over r. Okay, we can make this work. We can, we can look at this and say, this is a half r minus a third r. This comes out to be one-sixth r overall when you add it up. <coughs> and so we can solve this to find that, and I'll solve it down here, C2 has to equal R times this. So that is one sixth, looks like rho naught R squared over six epsilon naught. That's my C2. That's my, that's my C2. And so that tells me then what my second constant integration is. And at this point, I have my result. I have the field everywhere. Let me write that down. I can say that the electric field equals my first case is going to tell me that it is rho naught over epsilon naught times one half s minus one third I'm uh, sorry I didn't put that in the right place one third s squared over r that's true when zero is less than or equal to s is less than or equal to r and it's equal to this over s, so rho naught r squared over 6 epsilon naught s when s is greater than or equal to r. And that tells me my electric field. I found it in both regions, and we can ch you can check, as we just showed, that it matches at s equals r and at 0 at s equals 0, as it has to be for our boundaries. This is how you use Gauss's law to solve for the electric field in this case. It's a, it's a five-step process. Five-step process, it's not too bad. And to use that process, it just boils down to recognizing which one of our three special cases we're in, using the known divergence, the known formula for the divergence part of Gauss's law in that special case, and then just doing some, breaking into ranges, doing some calculus in each range separately, and then figure out the constant, uh, constant of integration to find C1 and C2, figuring those out from boundary conditions, from matching up at the middle or at the boundaries, at the edges. And that will, in general, be enough to give you all you need to solve for, uh, to solve for the electric field in one of these three special cases. I like it. Gauss's Law is a really elegant way of solving problems this way, and I hope you enjoy that too.